Hello and welcome to part 2 of the history of physics. I hope you liked the previous video of early physics. In this video we will cover years that were significant to changes or discoveries with science in general. As you can see as time goes on science and knowledge inevitably develops including today and beyond. Science was still primitive to the 1800s till today but our knowledge is the farthest thing from definitive even today as we have a profound amount to learn about the universe. As I assume most of you love cosmology, astronomy and theories of the universe, these times are more known for particle physics and quantum theories in particular or more abstract physics. Again feel free to comment any future video ideas you may have. Let's get right into it. William Prout was an expert in physical chemistry. In 1815, he studied the base on the tables of atomic weights. He hypothesized that every atomic weight is a negative integer of hydrogen. He implied that a hydrogen atom is the fundamental particle, which he called a protyle, and that the other elements are made of connections of a number of other hydrogen atoms. Prout's theory was highly favorable and worthwhile for future discoveries of atomic masses and theories, particularly before 1869, which is when the periodic table was invented. Richard Laming was specifically known for the atoms and particles in the theory of electricity. Between the years of 1838 to 1851, he published his thesis with speculating the electrical makeup of atoms. The piece insinuated that an electrical atom made up of a core of material was surrounded by concentric shells of these particles. The piece also believed that these particles could be added or subtracted to any atom which would change its charge. Like many scientists, they are often less respected when they provide no evidence to back up their claims. As the Royal Society of London for Improving Natural Knowledge, a National Academy of Science essentially accused him of being a falsifier. He wanted to focus on his own work without publicly showing it. He spent years trying to find solutions to back up his claims, but it wasn't until the 1860s where he became interested in the telegraph and applied for two patents for improvement for the device. He found that this was perhaps the only way for people to even take his work seriously. Ludwig Boltzmann's theories were quite odd ones. It was known for theories of entropy and thermodynamic equilibrium. What was quite peculiar with his theories in particular were his speculations of the Boltzmann brain, which he named after himself. A Boltzmann brain is a hypothetical brain, complete with every memory of all life forms that ever existed in our universe, which can only arise from thermodynamic equilibrium. The only way it can appear is through random quantum fluctuations. Theoretical physicists and mathematicians have calculated an insane estimated probability of 1 to the power of 10 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 to the power of 90, or 1 in that number of randomly appearing in front of you. Theoretical physicists and mathematicians don't expect a Boltzmann brain to randomly fluctuate until the year 10 to the power of 10 to the power of 70 years into the future. With Boltzmann's theory on entropy, his formula states the number of possible microstates of a system in a thermodynamic equation equilibrium is consistent with its macroscopic thermodynamic properties, which account for the microstate of the system. The micro and macro level, the elements comprise of a vast number of roaming atoms, molecules and particles, which randomly collide with each other, and the walls form a hypothetical container. The group of microstates would be made up of a statistical distribution of probability for each microstate. Thus, the system can be described as a whole with only a few of the macroscopic states. The variables of the macroscopic parameters are energy E, volume V, pressure P, temperature T, etc. With all these scientific aspects considered, Boltzmann denoted his entropy symbol as this, which we all know as the omega symbol. It became the domain symbol for his theory of entropy because the S in his theoretical mathematical work was proportional to the natural logarithm of this equation. Since omega is a natural number of this, entropy is either zero or a positive in this as a mathematical result. Those mathematical results lead to accessible microstates being equally likely. The arrays that correspond to the maximum entropy at equilibrium have a random malfunction for each microstate. This means that all the thermodynamic properties such as pressure, volume or temperature connect to the microscopic and macroscopic from the quantum field mechanics. Those properties have the ability to cause a threat as they all coalesce together causing a mathematically disordered space-time, causing time and existence as we know of to tear apart and end. However, it is estimated made it to not happen for at least a Googleplex years. Joseph John Thompson or JJ Thompson discovered the electron atom in 1896. He was the first to suggest that one of the fundamental units of the atom was more than a thousand times smaller than a regular atom. 
suggesting that the atomic particle was now formally known as the electron. This was discovered through Thomson's explorations on the properties of cathode rays. On April 30th, 1897, following his other discovery, cathode rays could travel much further than air than expected for an atom-sized particle. The mass of the cathode rays were estimated by generating heat when the rays hit a thermal junction and comparing this with the magnetic deflection of the rays inside. His experiments suggested that not only the cathode rays were more than a thousand times lighter than a hydrogen atom, but their mass was also the same in whichever atom they came from. The discovery led to the conclusion that the rays were comprised of very light, negatively charged particles, which were a universal building block of atoms. Later, the future scientists preferred the name electron, which had originally been suggested by George Johnstone Stooney in 1891, prior to Thompson's discovery. Albert Einstein is arguably one of the most popular and respected physicists of all time. Many of us know his theory of special relativity, which Einstein published in 1905, which is where nothing can travel faster than the speed of light. The two key points in his theory was that the speed of light is constant for all observers, and second, that the observers moving at constant speeds should be subject to the same physical laws. These effects of these changes are apparent at high speeds, where objects moving at speeds close to the speed of light. His piece predicted that when measured from a moving observer, a clock carried by a moving object would appear to slow down, and the object itself would contradict in the direction of its motions. This was known as time dilation, which is also in conjunction with his theory of special relativity. Einstein's theories argued that the idea of a luminiferous ether, one of the leading theoretical entities in the physics at the time, was superfluous. His famous mathematical symbol or formula E equals mc squared is part of his mass energy equivalent segment of his theory. The mass energy equivalence is the juxtaposition of mass and energy in a system's rest frame. There are two values that differ between the units of their measurements. The E in Einstein's formula is the energy E of a particle in its rest frame, with a product of mass m with a speed of light squared, which is equal to c squared. The speed of light measures at exactly 299,792,458 meters per second, which is just under 300,000 kilometers per second. Now you may be asking, why can't we travel faster than that figure? Well, only objects that make up light and have no mass such as protons or elementary particles with an invariant mass of zero can. It's impossible for anything else to go at that speed because it would take an infinite amount of energy to do so. The faster an object travels, the more massive it becomes. As an accelerating object gains mass, it thus becomes heavier. It takes more and more energy to increase its speed. It would take an infinite amount of energy to make an object reach the speed of light. At least today, we only have ambitious speculations to break the light barrier, which could include antimatter-powered ships or getting mass-produced energy from a Dyson sphere on our star. Max Planck spent most of his academic career on quantum theory, the smallest amount of energy that can be emitted or absorbed in the form of electromagnetic radiation is known as quantum. Planck called the packets of energy quanta and he was able to assert that the energy of every quantum is identical to the frequency of the radiation multiplied by a universal constant that he derived, now known as Planck's constant. This is because the black body radiation, which is where a radiation is emitted and absorbed by non-reflective bodies in thermo equilibrium with one another. Planck also had his name as a theoretical minimum or maximum measurement when it comes to a certain quantity. For example, a Planck time is the smallest amount of time possible in the laws of physics, which is around negative one times the power of 44 seconds, or the Planck temperature, which is around 142 nanillion degrees Kelvin, which is the theoretical maximum possible temperature. This corresponds to the universe being that temperature one Planck time after the Big Bang. Many of you know a Planck particle or a Planck unit as being the smallest possible physical object at only negative 1.6 times to the 35th power meters. Thus, nothing can be smaller than a Planck unit. If we assume the Big Bang occurred with a quantum nature of energy that relates to an energy photon to its frequency, this would be equal to a negative integer of 6 negative to the power of 10 to the power of 34. In Heinrich Rudolf Hertz's theory, whom the unit was named after, proposed the theoretical barrier in energy would be enough to alter it being positive or negative from whatever the figure is according to his theory. If we take this into account, the negative integer translates into a positive number. Therefore, we get our entire universe's size being around 6 
6 to 10 decillion light years across as a result. Furthermore, if we fill the entire universe from top to bottom with nothing but Planck volumes, we would have around 10 to the power of 246, also known as the Planck number, which is our theoretical maximum for physical quantity in our universe. The point is that Planck is used as a figure somewhere in every unit of measurement such as frequency, mass, distance, etc. After experimenting with scintillation detectors and hydrogen nuclei, when a beam of alpha and beta particles were shot in the air, Ernest Rutherfield found that they were produced from the nitrogen atoms present in the atmosphere. He then proceeded to fire beams of alpha particles into pure nitrogen gas and observed that a greater number of hydrogen nuclei were produced. After Rutherfield concluded that hydrogen nuclei originated from the nitrogen atom, it was given 14N plus A, 17O plus P. This is where A is an alpha particle, which contains two protons and two neutrons, and P is a proton. When many combinations of hydrogen and nitrogen nuclei were discovered, it was officially named a proton in 1919. During the late 1920s, Charles Drummond Ellis, James Chadwick, Neville Mott and other colleagues all collaborated together on energy relating to beta decay and neutrinos and thus officially discovering them. Beta decay is where an unstable atomic nucleus loses its energy by radiation and transforms the original nucleide to an isobar that of nucleide. A neutrino is a subatomic particle that is similar to an electron but has no electrical charge and is much smaller in mass. They are one of the most abundant particles in the universe because they have little to no interaction with matter and they are hard to detect. Neutrinos were actually thought to even have a mass of zero, but was later discovered to have a very short range of weak force due to some scientific beliefs that they do in fact have some, but very little mass. However, the actual postulations are far from definitive as they behave in a singular manner. With beta decay on the other hand, the properties of their neutrons transforms into a proton by the emission of an electron accompanied by an anti-neutrino. Neither the beta particle nor its associated anti-neutrino exist in the nucleus prior to beta decay. Decay, but are created in the decay process. By this process, unstable atoms obtain a more stable ratio of protons and neutrons. The probability of a nuclei decaying due to beta and other forms of decay is determined by its nuclear binding energy. The binding energies of all existing nucleides from what is called the nuclear band or valley of stability. For either electron or positron emission to be energetically possible, the energy release or Q value must be positive. A shower of cosmic ray particles was known as a muon by physicists Carl D. Anderson and Seth Neddemeyer. Because of their masses, they were thought to be the particle that explains the strong force that binds protons and neutrons together with atomic nuclei. The muon was a discovery that was part of a sequence in the lepton group of subatomic particles, where they never react with nuclei or other particles through a strong interaction. A muon is somewhat unstable, with a half-life of only 2.2 microseconds, before decaying into an electron by the weak force and two types of neutrinos. Muons are charged and they decay by decreasing in energy by displacing electrons from atoms, which is known as ionization. When particles travel close to the speed of light, ionization evaporates energy in minimal amounts. This allows muons to significantly penetrate in cosmic radiation and can travel thousands of meters below Earth's surface. Clifford Charles Butler and George Dixon Rochester both discovered the kaon and the first strange particle. They did this in an experiment using a cloud chamber which was used to take photos. One of them seemed to be a charged particle decaying into something neutral. The particle is estimated to be roughly 200 times more massive than a proton. In particle physics, a kaon is a group of four mesons distinguished by a quantum number called strangeness. Though that's obviously not a numerical figure, it's called a number because they relate to the value of conserved quantities in the dynamics of a quantum system. The quantum numbers in this context correspond to eigenvalues of operators that attenuate with the Hamiltonian quantity that can be known as the precision at the same time as the same energy, and therefore they all correspond to their eigenspaces. A strange particle, however, is an elementary particle with a strangeness quantum number different from zero. They are members of a large family of elementary particles carrying the quantum number of strangeness. Murray Gell-Mann's work in the 1950s involved the discovery from both Butler and Rochester of their kaons and strange particles from the cosmic ray led him to propose that a quantum number called strangeness would be conserved by strong electromagnetic interactions but not by weak interactions. His other work, Gell-Mann Uku, mass formula is the sum rule for the masses of hadrons with a specific multiplot determined by their isospin and strangeness. Their charge would eventually lead to a systematic categorization of hadrons and ultimately the quark model 
of Hadron composition. With regards to his work on the strangeness with a baryon number, he characterised this as B of 1, which is the mathematical formula where the baryon number of the mesons, leptons and messenger particles always have an atom containing one proton and one neutron where the baryon number is a positive 1. 1964 was when the Higgs field was first proposed which was named after theoretical physicist Peter Higgs. It was more of a collaborative postulation with Peter Higgs's colleagues which include a number of names such as Francis Englert, Robert Brout, Gerald Gerlink, Carl Richard Hagen and Tom Kibble. Moreover, they all postulate together that a fundamental quantum field pervades space and from the Higgs mechanism provides a mass to all elementary particles that interact with it. The Higgs field was theorised to confer mass on quarks and leptons. It represents only a small proton of the masses and other subatomic particles such as protons and neutrons. These all comprise of gluons that bind quarks together with most of their particle masses. In particle physics, the Higgs mechanism is pivotal when demonstrating generation mechanism, which is the properties for mass sewage bosons. Without the Higgs mechanism, every boson would be massless. But measurements were later proven that W and Z bosons actually have an unconventionally large mass of around 80 GeV slash 2 squared, which is around negative 2 to the power of 26 kilos. W and Z bosons were not discovered until 1983, however which is why there are a later postulation. We will also touch on the discoveries of W and Z bosons in that year shortly as well. On our current topic of Peter Higgs's theory, they only remained speculations until 2012, which is when the official discovery happened, which again we will touch later on in the video. 2012 is a year where their discoveries expand drastically. The Stanford Linear Accelerator Center was an establishment by the Stanford University in 1968. The new establishment allowed better technology in firing protons and neutrons in atomic nuclei and science more broadly. Muons, neutrinos and other particles were experimented later that year, but all physical, mathematic and scientific laws remained the same. The enhancement in the technology absorbed some collision in kinetic energy, making them inelastic. This is where inelastic scattering is a fundamental scattering process in which the kinetic energy of an incident particle is not conserved. This is somewhat contradictory to Ernest Rutherfield's scattering theory, which was hypothesized as an elastic having no loss of kinetic energy, with an electron emerging from the nucleus and its trajectory and velocity being detectable. The analysis written by physicists at Stanford University have concluded with pretty much concrete evidence that the hadron do in fact have an internal structure. As Rutherfield's theory said the contrary, his theory was therefore disproven. The crux of the problem with Rutherfield's theory is that he couldn't explain why negatively charged electrons remain in orbit when they should instantly fall into the positively charged nucleus. There are so many types of quarks. The charm quark was discovered to be produced concomitantly by two teams in November of 1974. Burton Richter, who was a member at the Stanford Linear Accelerator Center, and Samuel Ting, who was a member of the Brookhaven Natural Laboratory. When I say is or was, it means the individual is either alive or deceased. However, the charm quarks were discerned bound with charm antiquarks in mesons. The two colleagues assigned the discoveries of mesons as two different symbols, which were these. It thus became known as a J psi meson. J psi meson is encompassed as a charm anti charm quark pair. Both Richter and Ting shared the Nobel Prize for their discovery in 1976. Also, every physicist we talked about are all Nobel Prize winners. The discovery and theory persuades the physics community of the quark's model validity. The discovery of the bottom quark in 1977 by Leon Letterman was another important discovery when it comes to particle physics. Letterman was a team member at the Fernie Lab, which is an association with Columbia University and is a laboratory that specializes in high energy particle physics. It is also the location of where the bottom quark was discovered. An upsilon meson had an astonishing mass of 1.5 attojoules, which was 10 times the energy mass of a proton. The upsilon meson was an interesting discovery. It had a very short lifetime of only 1.21 times to the negative 20th seconds and was hard to detect. So what Letterman's team did was to fire a beam of protons at a target. A variety of mesons were produced and decayed. It in fact decayed into muons where they could be detected and tracked. This effective method allowed energies and momentum of the muons which could then be traced back to find the new upsilon particle and mass. Once this method was utilised, the team were able to get a more accurate hypothesis of these particles. When they discovered that the upsilon meson had a juxtaposition of other binding energies of particles. This is essentially how Letterman discovered the bottom quark as an official discovery. W and Z bosons are vector bosons that are really known as weak bosons. They were both discovered by Simon van der Meer and Carlo Rubbia in 1983. 
WNZ bosons are known for having the shortest lifespan of any physical object ever in theory, with a half-life of only a mere 3 times 10 to the power of negative 25 seconds. The W bosons either have a positive or negative electric charge of one elementary charge and are each other's antiparticles. The Z boson is electrically neutral and its own separate antiparticle. The three bosons all have a spin of one. Both positive and negative W bosons have a magnetic moment, but the Z has none. The W bosons are named after the weak force, and the Z bosons were named for having zero electric charge. After 18 years of research, a team at the Fermilab finally discovered the top quark. When it was theorized back in 1973, it was initially thought to be low in mass, but scientists were highly astounded that it was quite the opposite. As a matter of fact, it was almost as massive as a gold atom, making it the most massive of all observed elementary particles. The top quark obtains its mass from combining the Higgs boson. This grouping is the largest and strongest combination at the scale of the weak interactions and above. The top quark interacts with the gluons of the strongest interaction and is typically produced in the hadron colliders through this process. However, once they're produced, the top quark can only decay through weak force. It decays to a W boson, a bottom or a strange quark. It more often than not decays into either a bottom or strange quark. The least common decay is a down quark. I'll briefly touch on neutrino oscillation as we're almost ready to wrap up shortly. Once again, neutrinos are massless elementary particles. However, in 1998, Japanese physicist Takaki J. Kita discovered confounding evidence of neutrino oscillation with atmospheric atoms. Neutrino oscillation is a quantum mechanical phenomenon in which a neutrino created with a specific lepton family member such as electrons, muons or taus. They can later be measured to have a different family number. The probability of measuring any of those three types varies as it propagates through space. Lena Howe and her team at Harvard University used a Bose-Einstein condensate to stop a beam of light entirely. Work on these experiments later led to the transfer of light to matter, then from matter back to light, a process with important implications for quantum encryption and quantum computing. More recent work has involved research into novel interactions between ultra-cold atoms and nanoscopic scale systems. The Bose-Einstein condensate is a state of matter that is usually formed with gas bosons at hyperload densities, which is cooled to temperatures very close to absolute zero. They can range from 200 nanokelvin to 40 picokelvin, which is just a very tiny fraction above absolute zero. Under these extreme conditions, a large number of bosons occupy the lowest quantum state to the point where a microscopic quantum mechanical phenomenon becomes more apparent at such macroscopic levels, particularly when wave function interface occurs. It is formed by cooling gas at a profoundly low density to ultra-low temperatures. As we discussed earlier, the Higgs boson was theorized in 1964 and wasn't discovered until 2012. It was confirmed by the Large Hadron Collider at CERN in Switzerland. It was nearly a 50-year effort by Higgs and other physicists to prove the existence or non-existence of the Higgs boson. It took a long time to discover because of direct production, detection and verification of the boson, which needed to confirm the discovery and examine the properties required for such a major experimental project from advanced computing resources. Most of these experiments aim to exclude ranges of masses that the Higgs could not have until the early 2010s. It was essentially thanks to the construction of the Large Hadron Collider that helped prove Higgs's theory real. However, the Higgs boson also has some very grim theories when it was discovered. I've covered quantum collapse or vacuum decay in my past videos and how it can occur, but this was Peter Higgs's additional theory in relation to the Higgs boson. In simple terms, if a Higgs boson is not stable in the Higgs field, then it would flow through quantum tunneling by moving at fundamentally and ludicrously slow speeds of minus 1 times 10 to the negative 100 meters per year, which means vacuum decay engulfing our universe is not possible for at least a good goal years at an absolute bare minimum. So until then, it poses no threat whatsoever. The Large Hadron Collider is the largest particle accelerator in the world and is designed specifically for experiments of high energy tests of the standard model. The Large Hadron Collider has been a game changer when it comes to physics and science, and scientists and experimental physicists as of today are trying to boost protons and other particles away from all matter we know of. Therefore, we're trying to generate antimatter acceleration for these particles to break the light barrier. As of now, we've only managed to reach 299,792,457.9999 meters, meters per second, which seems to imply that nothing can travel faster than the speed of light after all. But that may not be entirely true. 
In 2019, scientists and experimental physicists like Ethan Siegel managed to artificially create antimatter by preventing collision of protons with other particles. It only lasted for a mere negative 1 times 10 to the negative 27 seconds before dropping speed. Siegel theorized that the protons skipped the exact speed of light being 299,792,458 meters per second and postulated that the speed jumped from 299,792,457 to 459 meters per second, thus hypothesizing that you can travel slower or faster but not at the speed of light. If his theory turns out to be proven, then this could potentially disprove Einstein's theory of relativity. Siegel also recently won the Nobel Prize for Quantum Entanglement in October 2022. Well, that's it for today, and there was quite a lot to get through. There were also plenty of other events in physics which I couldn't include as I didn't want these videos to be too lengthy. If you've watched both part 1 and part 2, thank you for watching and hopefully you like them. Despite the fact that we've come such a long way in science, there's still so much for us to learn and understand and I really hope we keep learning and expanding our knowledge and scientific abilities for an inconceivably long time. Hope you like these videos and let me know what your thoughts were on them. Thanks for watching.